Tech Study 9th Standard ICSC Chemistry Chapter 3 Water. Water is a universal solvent because it dissolves a large number of substances like salts, sugars, inorganic substances and even some organic substances. That's because water has a high dielectric constant. It can break the bonds between the ions or even in polar covalent compounds. For example, when you dissolve sodium chloride in water, water breaks the bond between Na and Cl to give you ions of sodium and chloride in water. That's why sodium chloride dissolves in water. Now in a salt solution, uh, water is called the solvent, that is uh, the liquid medium of dissolution. Salt is a solute of course and the mixture, the homogeneous mixture is called a solution. Now solutions may be dilute or concentrated depending on the uh, relative quantity of the solute. If the solute is relatively small in quantity, it is called dilute solution. For example, a glass of water with just a pinch of salt in it. A concentrated solution on the other hand has a large amount of solute comparatively. For example, a glass of water with um, 12 spoons of salt dissolved in it will be very concentrated. Solutions may be true solutions or they may be colloids. Colloids look like a solution but when we see with the help of a microscope we discover that the solute is not dissolved completely in the solvent. A true solution on the other hand will be totally homogeneous even under a microscope because the particles are so small they cannot be seen even with a the microscope. They will not settle down due to sedimentation nor can they be filtered out even with an ultra filter. The only way to separate uh, the solute and the solvent in this case would be by physical means like uh, evaporation. Any solution which can dissolve more of the solute at that temperature is called unsaturated solution. For example, uh, it's dinner time and you've just had one slice of pizza, you can eat more, you are unsaturated. On the other hand, if you cannot eat any more, you say you are saturated. Similarly, a solution which cannot dissolve more of the solute at that temperature, we call it saturated. Temperature is important here because if you heat the solution, then the capacity to dissolve a salt usually increases. So if I have a saturated solution which cannot dissolve more solute and if I heat it, then that hot water or the solution will now become unsaturated because at a high temperature it can dissolve a few more spoons of the salt. Another way to make it dilute, uh, I'm sorry, unsaturated will be add more solvent that is add more water to it. Sometimes a solution can hold even more solute at a given temperature than the saturated solution. For example, uh, let's say at the room temperature, 100 uh, milliliters of water can dissolve 10 grams of a particular salt. But under some special circumstances, we can force it to dissolve more than 10 grams of salt, maybe 15 grams of salt. So more than its capacity. This is called a super saturated solution. For example, if you are saturated, you are full, you've had your dinner and then comes the sizzling brownie. Even though you said that you are completely full, you will make way for that brownie in your tummy. You will become super saturated and super happy as well. Let's uh, study an example to prepare a super saturated solution. We'll use a special salt, uh, potassium nitrate. When you dissolve it in boiling water, it will dissolve a lot of the potassium nitrate. Now, when you cool such a solution, the excess of potassium nitrate will crystallize out. You see, cold water won't be able to dissolve so much of salt. So as the temperature decreases, its solubility, the solubility of potassium nitrate will decrease and the excess of it will crystallize out, but not all of it. In this case, the cold water will have more potassium nitrate dissolved in it than ideally it could. That means it is more saturated than a normal saturated solution of potassium nitrate prepared normally. So such a solution is called super saturated solution. Now let's study the qualitative effect of temperature on solubility of solids. Now there are some salts whose solubility increases with rise in temperature. We need to learn all the examples here. Potassium nitrate is the best example. If you look at the graph solubility curve, it clearly shows that solubility increases with increase in temperature. 
Sodium chloride, on the other hand, the solubility increases only slightly with rise in temperature. That is why the graph is almost a flat line. There are some interesting salts like calcium sulfate or calcium hydroxide, but this above 70 degrees Celsius. Now these salts, their solubility decreases with rise in temperature. That means hot water can dissolve less of it. Now the solubility of solids is independent of change in pressure. The external air pressure does not affect the solubility of these salts. On the other hand, when we talk about gases, for gases, more the external pressure, more is the solubility of the gas. That's why carbonated drinks have so much carbon dioxide dissolved in them because they have been dissolved under great pressure. On the other hand, the effect of temperature on the solubility of gases is that higher the temperature, less is the solubility of gases. Now the Henry's law states that at any given temperature, the mass of a gas dissolved by a fixed volume of liquid is directly proportional to the pressure on the surface of the liquid. So if the pressure is decreased, the solubility of the gas will also decrease. That is why when you open the soft drink bottle, the carbon dioxide fizzes out. Because the moment you open the cap, the pressure inside decreases. So the solubility of carbon dioxide will also decrease. And all the excess carbon dioxide which was forcibly dissolved in the water will now escape out. The effect of temperature on solubility of gases is that colder the water, more is the solubility of gases. That is why the soft drinks are chilled before they are consumed because that would dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide and such gases give taste to the water. If you boil water, then it loses its taste. It turns flat because all the carbon dioxide and other gases which were dissolved in water will escape because high temperature means less solubility of the gas. Now one thing to be noted is that different gases have different solubility in water. So oxygen is more soluble in water than nitrogen. That is why the percentage of oxygen out of all the air dissolved in water is a bit higher compared to um, its percentage in the normal atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, the oxygen's percentage is around 21% out of all the air. But in the dissolved water, oxygen's percentage is 33% out of all the air dissolved. Comparatively, nitrogen's percentage is just 66% out of all the air dissolved in water. Although in the atmosphere, it accounts for around 78% of all the air. Next, let's talk about crystals. Crystals are homogeneous solids. They have a particular shape and they're very symmetrical. They are often formed by a process called crystallization. When you take a hot saturated solution and you cool it, then the excess of the solutes dissolved in water will crystallize out because their solubility would decrease. Now there are many salts which have a fixed number of water molecules associated with it. This dot represents a loose chemical combination. Such water is called water of crystallization. It's because of this water of crystallization that this salt exists in the crystalline form and this is called hydrated copper sulfate and it has a typical color which is blue. If you heat this, then the water of crystallization will just evaporate, leaving behind the anhydrous copper sulfate and its color is white and it will no longer be crystalline. It will be amorphous, that is powdery. We have many such examples of salts which have water of crystallization and we need to learn their formulae and their names and the fixed number of water molecules in the molecules of the hydrated crystals. For example, calcium sulfate has 2H2O. It's also called gypsum. Calcium chloride hexahydrate will have 6H2O. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. Green vitriol is iron 2 sulfate heptahydrate. Globus salt is sodium sulfate, decahydrate. We also have something called white vitriol, which is zinc sulfate, heptahydrate. Now there are many salts like potassium chloride, sodium chloride, which don't have any hydrated versions. They are anhydrous and yet they are crystals. Even sugar is a crystal, but it doesn't, it is not hydrated. It does not have any water of crystallization. 
Next, now let's understand the difference between efflorescent and deliquescent substances, which are quite opposite to each other. Efflorescent substances are crystalline hydrated salts. For example, sodium bicarbonate decahydrate, that's also called washing soda, or even copper sulfate, pentahydrate. Now, when they are exposed to the atmosphere, they lose their water of crystallization, that is, they lose their moisture completely or partially, and they become anhydrous. So global salt will simply become sodium sulfate. This phenomenon is called efflorescence, and such substances are called efflorescent substances. Once they lose their water of crystallization, they are no longer crystalline, they become amorphous. Deliquescent substances, on the other hand, are water-soluble salts, which when exposed to the atmosphere, absorb moisture. They become saturated solutions, in fact. So they change their state. For example, uh, ferric chloride, cal calcium chloride, sodium hydroxide. That is why ferric chloride and other such substances are stored in airtight bottles. Because if they come in contact with the moisture in the atmosphere, they will absorb them and become a solution. Sodium chloride is not deliquescent and yet the table salt that we eat, if we keep it in a container during the monsoon season, even that becomes very moist. Well, that's because the table salt is not pure sodium chloride. It, it has other impurities like calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, which are deliquescent. So they will absorb the moisture from the air. Hygroscopic substances also absorb moisture from the atmosphere, just like deliquescent substances. But the major difference between hygroscopic substances and deliquescent substances is that hygroscopic substances don't change their state. So if you have a solid hygroscopic substance, like quicklime, it will absorb the moisture, but it would not turn into a solution. Silica gel is often used in those silica pouches which are kept in new bags or other articles to keep them dry because silica gel will absorb the moisture and prevent the growth of fungus inside the bag. We have some liquid hygroscopic substances as well. Deliquescent substances cannot be liquid, they are solid, but hygroscopic substances can be liquid like conch sulfuric acid. It absorbs the moisture available. So many of these hygroscopic substances can be used as a drying agent. And if it is used inside a device called a desiccator, it's called a desiccating agent. They are used to absorb moisture. Now we have to be careful about which hygroscopic substance is being used as a drying agent because a chemical reaction should not take place. For example, if we have some moist gas, let's take um, HCl. And we would like to remove the moisture from it. We can't use calcium oxide because calcium oxide being a base will react with HCl and a neutralization reaction will take place. So instead, let's use conch sulfuric acid, which won't react with the HCl, which will absorb all the moisture, and we'll get dry HCl gas from it. On the other hand, conch sulfuric acid can also be used as a dehydrating agent. It can absorb moisture where it was not present in the first place. That is, it can remove the chemically combined water or the elements of water, that is hydrogen and oxygen, from the compounds. Now, glucose does not have any water of crystallization or moisture, but it does have HNO. So, sulfuric acid will react with it, break the bonds to leave carbon and water, and this water will be absorbed by the sulfuric acid. And only the carbon will be left behind, which will look a black, like a black residue. So, here a chemical reaction takes place. When drying agents are used, on the other hand, there is no chemical reaction taking place. But for a dehydrating agent, there is a chemical reaction taking place. Next, let's talk about hard water and soft water. Water is said to be hard when it does not lather readily with ordinary soap. There is no foam created when you rub a soap in that water. Which is uh, not good for washing clothes because this would lead to wastage of the soap. On the other hand, water which does lather readily is called soft water. Example, rainwater is soft. Now, the cause of hardness in water is the presence of certain salts, that is calcium and magnesium bicarbonates, sulfates and chlorides. Now, remember the types of hardness. It can be temporary hardness or permanent hardness. In temporary hardness, the salts are calcium and magnesium bicarbonates. But if we have calcium and magnesium chlorides and sulfates, then there is permanent hardness. 
temporary hardness is called so because you simply have to boil it to get rid of the hardness because when you boil the bicarbonates they decompose to form carbonates which are insoluble they can be filtered out to get soft water but permanent hardness cannot be removed by using the boiling method because the chlorides and sulfates won't decompose on boiling them here we will have to use washing soda to remove the permanent hardness yeah this method of uh, addition of washing soda can be used to remove temporary hardness as well and that is preferable because boiling large amounts of water wastes fuel let's understand this with the help of some reactions first of all how is a uh, temporary hardness caused well when rain water falls on the earth it would react with the minerals present in the rocks and it could react with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to form some bicarbonates now these bicarbonates will dissolve in water and because of these if we rub soap in this water the chemicals of the soap will react with the bicarbonates to produce some insoluble scum this will just precipitate on the clothes and spoil them and also the soap gets wasted so we need to get rid of these uh, bicarbonates and the easiest way to do that is by boiling them when you boil them they will be decomposed to carbonates now these carbonates are insoluble so we can filter them out and throw them away so the water which is left does not have these bicarbonates or the carbonates so the temporary hard water has now become soft water it may have other minerals which is fine but if we have sulfates sulfates and chlorides of calcium and magnesium then boiling won't be useful then we'll have to use washing soda that is sodium carbonate because then sodium carbonate can react with these sulfates and uh, chlorides and even bicarbonate to produce the precipitates of carbonates this can again be filtered out so the water which is left behind is soft water which will lather with soap removing hardness is important because there are many disadvantages of using hard water in um, processes like laundries we can't use it with soap we can't use it for uh, industrial purposes because they may form a crust inside boilers so in such industries soft water is used by the way nowadays um we can wash clothes even with hard water not by using soap but by using synthetic detergents you see when we use soap that reacts with the hard water to form scum which spoils the clothes but when we use detergents the detergents do not form any scum with the salts of the hard water because when they react with the salts of the hard water then the salts new salts produced are soluble that's the advantage of detergents over ordinary soap now if we give you hard water and you want to make it soft what would you do well if it's uh, temporary soft we can just boil it and filter out the carbonate but how can we be sure that the water left behind is soft well simply rub the uh, soap in it it will start lathering again hi students this is aj sir if you like this video press the like button if you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures email me or message me on instagram check the description for more information